Chapter One of That Sweet Little Old Lady. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Chenever. This story was first published in Astounding Science Fiction, September and October, 1959. That Sweet Little Old Lady by Randall Garrett. Chapter One. What are we going to call that sweet little old lady now that mother is a dirty word? Dave Foley. In nineteen fourteen, it was enemy aliens. In nineteen thirty, it was wobblies. In nineteen fifty seven, it was fellow travelers. And in nineteen seventy one, they could be anywhere, Andrew J. Burris said, with an expression which bordered on exasperated horror. They could be all around us. Heaven only knows. He pushed his chair back from his desk and stood up, a chunky little man with bright blue eyes and large hands. He paced to the window and looked out at Washington, and then he came back to the desk. A persistent office rumor held that he had become head of the FBI purely because he happened to have an initial J in his name, but in his case the J stood for Jeremiah. And at the moment his tone expressed all the hopelessness of that Old Testament prophet's lamentations. "'We're helpless,' he said, looking at the young man with the crisp brown hair who was sitting across the desk. That's what it is. We're helpless. Kenneth Malone tried to look dependable. Just tell me what to do, he said. You're a good agent, Kenneth, Burris said. You're one of the best. That's why we've picked you for this job. And I want to say that I picked you personally. Believe me, there's never been anything like it before. I'll do my best, Malone said at random. He was twenty-eight and he had been an FBI agent for three years. In that time he had, among other things, managed to break up a gang of smugglers, track down a counterfeiting ring, and capture three kidnappers. For reasons which he could neither understand nor explain, no one seemed willing to attribute his record to luck. "'I know you will,' Burris said. "'And if anybody can crack this case, Malone, you're the man.' It's just that everything sounds so impossible, even after all the conferences we've had. Conferences? Malone said vaguely. He wished the chief would get to the point. Any point. He smiled gently across the desk and tried to look competent and dependable and reassuring. Burris's expression didn't change. You'll get the conference tapes later, Burris said. You can study them before you leave. I suggest you study them very carefully, Malone. Don't be like me. Don't get confused." He buried his face in his hands. Malone waited patiently. After a few seconds Burris looked up. "'Did you read books when you were a child?' he asked. Malone said, "'What?' "'Books,' Burris said. "'When you were a child. Read them.' "'Sure I did,' Malone said. Bomba the Jungle Boy, and Doolittle, and Lucky Star, and Little Women. Little Women? When Beth died, Malone said, I wanted to cry. But I didn't. My father said big boys don't cry. And your father was right, Burris said. Why, when I was a... Uh, never mind. Forget about Beth and your father. Think about Lucky Star for a minute. Remember him? Sure, Malone said. I like those books. You know, it's funny, but the books you read when you're a kid, they kind of stay with you. Know what I mean? I can still remember that one about Venus, for instance. Gee, that was— Never mind about Venus, too, Burris said sharply. Keep your mind on the problem. Yes, sir, Malone said. He paused. What problem, sir? He added. The problem we're discussing, Burris said. 
He gave Malone a bright, blank stare. Just listen to me. Yes, sir. All right, then. Burris took a deep breath. He seemed nervous. Once again he stood up and went to the window. This time he spoke without turning. Remember how everybody used to laugh about spaceships and orbital satellites and life on other planets? That was just in those lucky star books. That was all just for kids, wasn't it? Well, I don't know, Malone said slowly. Sure, it was all for kids, Burris said. It was laughable. Nobody took it seriously. Well, somebody must— You just keep quiet and listen, Burris said. Yes, sir, Malone said. Burris nodded. His hands were clasped behind his back. We're not laughing any more, are we, Malone? he said without moving. There was silence. Well, are we? Do you want me to answer, sir? Of course I did, Burris snapped. You told me to keep quiet, and— Never mind what I told you, Burris said. Just do what I told you. Yes, sir, Malone said. No, sir, he added after a second. No, sir, what? Burris asked softly. No, sir, we're not laughing any more, Malone said. Ah, Burris said. And why aren't we laughing any more? There was a little pause. Malone said tentatively, "'Because there's nothing to laugh about, sir?' Burris whirled. "'On the head,' he said happily. "'You've hit the nail on the head, Kenneth. I knew I could depend on you.' His voice grew serious again and thoughtful. "'We're not laughing any more, because there's nothing to laugh about.' We have orbital satellites, and we've landed on the moon with an atomic rocket. The planets are the next step, and after that, the stars. Man's heritage, Kenneth. The stars. And the stars, Kenneth, belong to man, not to the Soviets. Yes, sir, Malone said soberly. So, Burris said, we should learn not to laugh any more. But have we? I don't know, sir. We haven't, Burris said with decision. Can you read my mind? No, sir, Malone said. Can I read your mind? Malone hesitated. At last he said, Not that I know of, sir. Well, I can't, Burris snapped. And can any of us read each other's mind? Malone shook his head. No, sir, he said. Burris nodded. That's the problem, he said. That's the case I'm sending you out to crack. This time the silence was a long one. At last Malone said, What problem, sir? Mind reading, Burris said. There's a spy at work in the Nevada plant, Kenneth. And the spy is a telepath. The videotapes were very clear and very complete. There were a great many of them, and it was long after nine o'clock when Kenneth Malone decided to take a break and get some fresh air. Washington was a good city for walking, even at night, and Malone liked to walk. Sometimes he pretended, even to himself, that he got his best ideas while walking, but he knew perfectly well that wasn't true. His best ideas just seemed to come to him out of nowhere, precisely as the situation demanded them. He was just lucky, that was all. He had a talent for being lucky. But nobody would ever believe that. A record like his was spectacular even in the annals of the FBI, and Burris himself believed that the record showed some kind of superior ability. Malone knew that wasn't true, but what could he do about it? After all, he didn't want to resign, did he? It was kind of romantic and exciting to be an FBI agent, even after three years. A man got a chance to travel around a lot and see things, and it was interesting. The pay was pretty good, too. The only trouble was that if he didn't quit, 
he was going to have to find a telepath. The notion of telepathic spies just didn't sound right to Malone. It bothered him in a remote sort of way. Not that the idea of telepathy itself was alien to him. After all, he was even more aware than the average citizen that research had been going on in that field for something over a quarter of a century, and that the research was even speeding up. But the cold fact that a telepath-detecting device had been invented somehow shocked his sense of propriety, and his notions of privacy. It wasn't decent, that was all. There ought to be something sacred, he told himself angrily. He stopped walking and looked up. He was on Pennsylvania Avenue, heading toward the White House. That was no good. He went to the corner and turned off down the block. He had, he told himself, nothing at all to see the President about. Not yet, anyhow. The streets were dark and very peaceful. I get my best ideas while walking, Malone said without convincing himself. He thought back to the videotapes. The report on the original use of the machine itself had been on one of the first tapes, and Malone could still see and hear it. That was one thing he did have, he reflected. His memory was pretty good. Burris had been the first speaker on the tapes, and he'd given the serial and reference number in a cold, matter-of-fact voice. His face had been perfectly blank, and he looked just like the head of the FBI people were accustomed to seeing on their TV and newsreel screens. Malone wondered what had happened to him between the time the tapes had been made and the time he'd sent for Malone. Maybe the whole notion of telepathy was beginning to get to him, Malone thought. Burris recited the standard tape opening in a rapid mumble. Any person or agent unauthorized for this tape, please refrain from viewing further, under penalties as prescribed by law. Then he looked off, out past the screen to the left, and said, Dr. Thomas O'Connor of Westinghouse Laboratories. Will you come here, Dr. O'Connor? Dr. O'Connor came into the lighted square of screen, slowly looking all around him. This is very fascinating, he said, blinking in the lamplight. I hadn't realized that you people took so many precautions. He was, Malone thought, somewhere between fifty and sixty, tall and thin with skin so transparent that he nearly looked like a living X-ray. He had pale blue eyes and pale white hair, and, Malone thought, if there ever were a contest for the best-looking ghost, Dr. Thomas O'Connor would win it, hands, or phalanges, down. This is all necessary for the national security, Burris said a little sternly. Oh, Dr. O'Connor said quickly, I realize that, of course. Naturally, I can certainly see that. Let's go ahead, shall we? Burris said. O'Connor nodded. Certainly, certainly. Burris said, Well, then, and paused. After a second, he started again. Now, Dr. O'Connor, would you please give us a sort of verbal rundown on this for our records? Of course, Dr. O'Connor said. He smiled into the video cameras and cleared his throat. I take it you don't want an explanation of how this machine works. I mean, you don't want a technical exposition, do you? No, Burris said, and added, not by any means. Just tell us what it does. Dr. O'Connor suddenly reminded Malone of a professor he'd had in college for one of the law courses. He had, Malone thought, the same smiling gravity of demeanor the same condescending attitude of absolute authority. It was clear that Dr. O'Connor lived in a world of his own, a world that was not even touched by the common run of men. Well, he began, to put it very simply, the device indicates whether or not a man's mental, uh, processes are being influenced by outside, by outside influences. He gave the cameras another little smile. If you will allow me, I will demonstrate on the machine itself. 
He took two steps that carried him out of camera range and returned wheeling a large, heavy-looking box. Dangling from the metal covering were a number of wires and attachments. A long cord led from the box to the floor and snaked out of sight to the left. Now, Dr. O'Connor said, he selected a single lead, apparently, Malone thought at random. This electrode— Just a moment, doctor, Burris said. He was eyeing the machine with a combination of suspicion and awe. A while back you mentioned something about outside influences. Just what specifically does that mean? With some regret, Dr. O'Connor dropped the lead. Telepathy, he said, by outside influences, I mean influences on the mind, such as telepathy or mind reading of some nature. I see, Burris said. You can detect a telepath with this machine. I'm afraid. Well, some kind of a mind reader, anyhow, Burris said. We won't quarrel about terms. Certainly not, Dr. O'Connor said. The smile he turned on Burris was as cold and empty as the inside of Orbital Station One. What I meant was, if you will permit me to continue, that we cannot detect any sort of telepath or mind-reader with this device. To be frank, I very much wish that we could. It would make everything a great deal simpler. However, the laws of psionics don't seem to operate that way. Well, then, Burris said, what does the thing do? His face wore a mask of confusion. Momentarily, Malone felt sorry for his chief. He could remember how he'd felt himself when that law professor had come up with a particularly baffling question in class. This machine, Dr. O'Connor said with authority, detects the slight variations in mental activity that occur when a person's mind is being read. You mean if my mind were being read right now? Not right now, Dr. O'Connor said. You see, the bulk of this machine is in Nevada. The structure is both too heavy and too delicate for transport, and there are other qualifications. I mean theoretically, Burris said. Theoretically, Dr. O'Connor began and smiled again, if your mind were being read, this machine would detect it, supposing that the machine were in operating condition and all the other qualifications had been met. You see, Mr. Burris, no matter how poor a telepath a man may be, he has some slight ability, even if only very slight, to detect the fact that his mind is being read. You mean if somebody were reading my mind I'd know it? Burris said. His face showed, Malone realized, that he plainly disbelieved this statement. You would know it, Dr. O'Connor said, but you would never know you knew it. To elucidate, in a normal person like you, for instance, or even like myself, the state of having one's mind read merely results in a vague, almost subconscious feeling of irritation, something that could easily be attributed to minor worries or fluctuations in one's hormonal balance. The hormonal balance, Mr. Burris, is— Thank you, Burris said with a trace of irritation. I know what hormones are. Ah, good, Dr. O'Connor said equably. In any case, to continue, this machine interprets those specific feelings as indications that the mind is being, ah, uh, eavesdropped upon. You could almost see the quotation marks around what Dr. O'Connor considered slang dropping into place, Malone thought. I see, Burris said with a disappointed air. But what do you mean it won't detect a telepath? Have you ever actually worked with a telepath? Certainly we have, Dr. O'Connor said. If we hadn't, how would we be able to tell that the machine was, in fact, indicating the presence of telepathy? The theoretical state of the art is not at present sufficiently developed to enable us to— I see, Burris said hurriedly. Only wait a minute. 
Yes. You mean you've actually got a real mind-reader? You've found one? One that works? Dr. O'Connor shook his head sadly. I'm afraid I should have said, Mr. Burris, that we did once have one, he admitted. He was, unfortunately, an imbecile, with a mental age between five and six, as nearly as we were able to judge. An imbecile? Burris said. But how were you able to— He could repeat a person's thoughts word for word, Dr. O'Connor said. Of course, he was utterly incapable of understanding the meaning behind them. That didn't matter. He simply repeated whatever you were thinking. Rather disconcerting. I'm sure, Burris said. But he was really an imbecile? There wasn't any chance of— Of curing him, Dr. O'Connor said. None, I'm afraid. We did at one time feel that there had been a mental breakdown early in the boy's life, and, indeed, it's perfectly possible that he was normal for the first year or so. The records we did manage to get on that period, however, were very much confused, and there was never any way of telling anything at all for certain. It's easy to see what caused the confusion, of course. Telepathy in an imbecile is rather an oddity, and any normal adult would probably be rather hesitant about admitting that he was capable of it. That's why we have not found another subject. We must merely sit back and wait for lightning to strike. Burris sighed. I see your problem, he said. But what happened to this imbecile boy of yours? Very sad, Dr. O'Connor said. Six months ago, at the age of fifteen, the boy simply died. He simply gave up and died. Gave up? That was as good an explanation as our medical department was able to provide, Mr. Burris. There was some malfunction, but we like to say that he simply gave up. Living became too difficult for him. All right, Burris said after a pause. This telepath of yours is dead, and there aren't any more where he came from. Or, if there are, you don't know how to look for them. All right. But to get back to this machine of yours, it couldn't detect the boy's ability? Dr. O'Connor shook his head. No, I'm afraid not. We've worked hard on that problem at Westinghouse, Mr. Burris, but we haven't yet been able to find a method of actually detecting telepaths. But you can detect— That's right, Dr. O'Connor said. We can detect the fact that a man's mind is being read. He stopped, and his face became suddenly morose. When he spoke again, he sounded guilty, as if he were making an admission that pained him. Of course, Mr. Burris, there's nothing we can do about a man's mind being read. Nothing whatever. He essayed a grin that didn't look very healthy. But at least, he said, you know you're being spied on. Burris grimaced. There was a little silence while Dr. O'Connor stroked the metal box meditatively, as if it were the head of his beloved. At last Burris said, Dr. O'Connor, how sure can you be of all this? The look he received made all the previous conversation seem as warm and friendly as a Christmas party by comparison. It was a look that froze the air of the room into a solid chunk, Malone thought. A chunk you could have chipped pieces from for souvenirs later when Dr. O'Connor had gone and you could get into the room without any danger of being quick frozen by the man's unfriendly eye. Mr. Burris, Dr. O'Connor said in a voice that matched the temperature of his gaze, please remember our slogan. Malone sighed. He fished in his pocket for a pack of cigarettes, found one, and extracted a single cigarette. He stuck it in his mouth and started fishing in various pockets for his lighter. He sighed again. He preferred cigars, a habit he'd acquired from the days when he'd filched them from his father's cigar case. But his mental picture of the fearless and alert young FBI agent didn't include a cigar.
Somehow, remembering his father as neither fearless nor exactly alert, anyway not the way the movies and the TV screens like to picture the words, he had the impression that cigars looked out of place on FBI agents. And it was, in any case, a small sacrifice to make. He found his lighter and shielded it from the brisk wind. He looked out over water at the Jefferson Memorial, and was surprised that he'd managed to walk as far as he had. Then he stopped thinking about walking, and took a puff of his cigarette, and forced himself to think about the job in hand. Naturally, the Westinghouse gadget had been declared ultra-top secret as soon as it had been worked out. Virtually everything was these days, and the whole group involved in the machine and its workings had been transferred without delay to the United States laboratories out in Yucca Flats, Nevada. Out there in the desert there just wasn't much to do, Malone supposed, except to play with the machine, and of course look at the scenery. But when you've seen one desert, Malone thought confusedly, you've seen them all. So the scientists ran experiments on the machine, and they made a discovery of a kind they hadn't been looking for. Somebody, they discovered, was picking the brains of the scientists there. Not the brains of the people working with the telepathy machine, and not the brains of the people working on the several other Earth-limited projects at Yucca Flats. They'd been reading the minds of some of the scientists, working on the new and highly classified non-rocket space drive. In other words, the Yucca Flats plant was infested with a telepathic spy. And how do you go about finding a telepath? Malone sighed. Spies that got information in any of the usual ways were tough enough to locate. A telepathic spy was a lot tougher proposition. Well, one thing about Andrew J. Burris, he had an answer for everything. Malone thought of what his chief had said. It takes a thief to catch a thief. And if the Westinghouse machine won't locate a telepathic spy, I know what will. What? Malone had asked. It's simple, Burris had said. Another telepath. There has to be one around somewhere. Westinghouse did have one, after all, and the Russians still have one. Malone, that's your job. Go out and find me a telepath. Burris had an answer for everything, all right, Malone thought. But he couldn't see where the answer did him very much good. After all, if it takes a telepath to catch a telepath, how do you catch the telepath you're going to use to catch the first telepath? Malone ran that through his mind again, and then gave it up. It sounded as if it should have made sense somehow, but it just didn't, and that was all there was to that. He dropped his cigarette to the ground and mashed it out with the toe of his shoe. Then he looked up. Out there, over the water, was the Jefferson Memorial. It stood, white in the floodlights, beautiful and untouchable in the darkness. Malone stared at it. What would Thomas Jefferson have done in a crisis like this? Jefferson, he told himself without much conviction, would have been just as confused as he was. But he'd have had to find a telepath, Malone thought. Malone determined that he would do likewise. If Thomas Jefferson could do it, the least he, Malone, could do was to give it a good try. There was only one little problem. Where, Malone thought, do I start looking? End of chapter 1「That Sweet Little Old Lady » by Randall Garrett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 2 Early the next morning Malone awoke on a plane, heading across the continent toward Nevada. He had gone home to sleep, and he'd had to wake up to get on the plane, and now here he was, waking up again. It seemed somehow like a vicious circle. 
The engine hummed gently as they pushed the big ship through the middle stratosphere's thinly distributed molecules. Malone looked out at the purple dark sky and set himself to think out his problem again. He was still mulling things over when the ship lowered its landing gear and rolled to a stop on the big field near Yucca Flats. Malone sighed and climbed slowly out of his seat. There was a car waiting for him at the airfield, though, and that seemed to presage a smooth time. Malone remembered calling Dr. O'Connor the night before, and congratulated himself on his foresight. Unfortunately, when he reached the main gate of the high double fence that surrounded the more than ninety square miles of United States laboratories, he found out that the entrance into that sanctum sanctorum of security wasn't as easy as he'd imagined, not even for an FBI man. His credentials were checked with the kind of minute care Malone had always thought people reserved for disputed art masterpieces, and it was with a great show of reluctance that the special security guards passed him inside as far as the office of the chief security officer. There the chief security officer himself, a man who could have doubled for Torquemada, eyed Malone with ill-concealed suspicion while he called Burris at FBI headquarters back in Washington. Burris identified Malone on the video screen, and the chief security officer, looking faintly disappointed, stamped the agent's pass and thanked the FBI chief. Malone had the run of the place. Then he had to find a courier jeep. The Westinghouse division, it seemed, was a good two miles away. As Malone knew perfectly well, the main portion of the entire Yucca Flats area was devoted solely to research on the new space drive, which was expected to make the rocket as obsolete as the blunderbuss, at least as far as space travel was concerned. Not, Malone thought uneasily, that the blunderbuss had ever been used for space travel, but he got off the subject hurriedly. The jeep whizzed by buildings, most of them devoted to aspects of the Nun rocket drive. The other projects based at Yucca Flats had to share what space was left, and that included, of course, the Westinghouse Research Project. It turned out to be a single, rather small white building with a fence around it. The fence bothered Malone a little, but there was no need to worry. This time he was introduced at once into Dr. O'Connor's office. It was paneled in wallpaper, manufactured to look like pine, and the telepathy expert sat behind a large black desk bigger than any Malone had ever seen in the FBI offices. There wasn't a scrap of paper on the desk. Its surface was smooth and shiny, and behind it the nearly transparent Dr. Thomas O'Connor was close to invisible. He looked in person just about the same as he'd looked on the FBI tapes. Malone closed the door of the office behind him, looked for a chair, and didn't find one. In Dr. O'Connor's office, it was perfectly obvious, Dr. O'Connor sat down. You stood and were uncomfortable. Malone took off his hat. He reached across the desk to shake hands with the telepathy expert, and Dr. O'Connor gave him a limp and fragile paw. "'Thanks for giving me a little time,' Malone said. "'I really appreciate it.' He smiled across the desk. His feet were already beginning to hurt. "'Not at all,' Dr. O'Connor said, returning the smile with one of his own special quick-frozen brand. I realize how important FBI work is to all of us, Mr. Malone. What can I do to help you? Malone shifted his feet. I'm afraid I wasn't very specific on the phone last night, he said. It wasn't anything I wanted to discuss over a line that might have been tapped. You see, I'm on the telepathy case. Dr. O'Connor's eyes widened the merest trifle. I see, he said. Well, I'll certainly do everything I can to help you. Fine, Malone said. Uh, let's get right down to business, then. Uh, the first thing I want to ask you about is this detector of yours. I understand it's too big to carry around, 
But how about making a smaller model? Smaller? Dr. O'Connor permitted himself a ghostly chuckle. <laughs> I'm afraid that isn't possible, Mr. Malone. I would be happy to let you have a small model of the machine, if we had one available, more than happy. I would like to see such a machine myself, as a matter of fact. Unfortunately, Mr. Malone— There just isn't one, right? Malone said. Correct, Dr. O'Connor said. And there are a few other factors. In the first place, the person being analyzed has to be in a specially shielded room, such as is used in encephalographic analysis. Otherwise, the mental activity of the other persons around him would interfere with the analysis. He frowned a little. I wish that we knew a bit more about psionic machines. The trouble with the present device, frankly, is that it is partly psionic and partly electronic, and we can't be entirely sure where one part leaves off and the other begins. Very trying, very trying indeed. I'll bet it is, Malone said sympathetically, wishing he understood what Dr. O'Connor was talking about. The telepathy expert sighed. Ah, however, he said, we keep working at it. Then he looked at Malone expectantly. Malone shrugged. Well, if I can't carry the thing around, I guess that's that, he said. But here's the next question. Do you happen to know the maximum range of a telepath? I mean, how far away can he get from another person and still read his mind? Dr. O'Connor frowned again. We don't have definite information on that, I'm afraid, he said. Poor little Charlie was rather difficult to work with. He was mentally incapable of cooperating in any way, you see. Little Charlie? Charles O'Neill was the name of the telepath we worked with, Dr. O'Connor explained. I remember, Malone said. The name had been on one of the tapes, but he just hadn't associated Charles O'Neill with Little Charlie. He felt as if he'd been caught with his homework undone. How did you manage to find him, anyway? he said. Maybe if he knew how Westinghouse had found their imbecile telepath, he'd have some kind of clue that would enable him to find one, too. Anyhow, it was worth a try. It wasn't difficult in Charlie's case, Dr. O'Connor said. He smiled. The child babbled all the time, you see. You mean he talked about being a telepath? Dr. O'Connor shook his head impatiently. No, he said, not at all. I mean that he babbled, literally. Here, I've got a sample recording in my files. He got up from his chair and went to the tall gray filing cabinet that hid in a far corner of the pine-paneled room. From a drawer he extracted a spool of common audio tape and returned to his desk. "'I'm sorry we didn't get full video on this,' he said, but we didn't feel it was necessary. He opened a panel in the upper surface of the desk and slipped the spool in. "'If you like, there are other tapes.' Maybe later, Malone said. Dr. O'Connor nodded and pressed the playback switch at the side of the great desk. For a second the room was silent. Then there was the hiss of empty tape and a brisk, masculine voice that overrode it. Westinghouse Laboratories, it said. 16 April 1970. Dr. Walker speaking. The voice you are about to hear belongs to Charles O'Neill, Chronological age, fourteen years, three months. Middle age, approximately five years. Further data on this case will be found in the file O'Neill. There was a slight pause filled with more tape hiss. Then the voice began. Push the switch for record in the park last Wednesday, and perhaps a different set of... Poor kid never makes any sense in... Trees and leaves all sunny with the electronics components of the reducing stage might be not as predictable when others are around, but to go with Sally some night in the it was a childish alto voice gabbling in a monotone. A phrase would be spoken. The voice would hesitate for just an instant. 
and then another totally disconnected phrase would come. The enunciation and pronunciation would vary from phrase to phrase, but the tone remained essentially the same, drained of all emotional content. In receiving psychocerebral impulses there isn't any nonsense and nothing but nonsense all the tomorrow or maybe Saturday with the girl tube might be replaceable only if something ought to be done for the Saturday would be a good time for work on the schematics tonight if there was a click as the tape was turned off and Dr. O'Connor looked up. It doesn't make much sense, Malone said, but the kid sure has a hell of a vocabulary for an imbecile. Vocabulary? Dr. O'Connor said softly. That's right, Malone said. Where'd an imbecile get words like psychocerebral? I don't think I know what that word means myself. Ah, Dr. O'Connor said, but that's not his vocabulary, you see. What Charlie is doing is simply repeating the thoughts of those around him. He jumps from mind to mind, simply repeating whatever he receives. His face assumed the expression of a man remembering a bad taste in his mouth. That's how we found him out, Mr. Malone, he said. It's rather startling to look at a blithering idiot and have him suddenly repeat the very thought that's in your mind. Malone nodded unhappily. It didn't seem as if O'Connor's information was going to be a lot of help, as far as catching a telepath was concerned. An imbecile, apparently, would give himself away if he were a telepath. But nobody else seemed to be likely to do that. And imbeciles didn't look like very good material for catching spies with. Then he brightened. Is it possible that the spy we're looking for really isn't a spy? Eh? I mean, suppose he's an imbecile, too. I doubt whether an imbecile would really be a spy, if you see what I mean. Dr. O'Connor appeared to consider the notion. After a little while, he said, It is, I suppose, possible, but the readings on the machine don't give us the same timing as they did in Charlie's case or even the same sort of timing. "'I don't quite follow you,' Malone said. Truthfully, he felt about three miles behind. But perhaps everything would clear up soon. He hoped so. On top of everything else, his feet were now hurting a lot more. "'Perhaps if I describe one of the tests we ran,' Dr. O'Connor said, "'things will be somewhat clearer.' He leaned back in his chair. Malone shifted his feet again and transferred his hat from his right hand to his left hand. "'We put one of our test subjects in the insulated room,' Dr. O'Connor said, "'and connected him to the detector. He was to read from a book, a book that was not too common. This was, of course, to obviate the chance that some other person nearby might be reading it, or might have read it in the past.' We picked The Blood is the Death by Hieronymus Melanchthon, which, as you may know, is a very rare book indeed. Sure, Malone said. He had never heard of the book, but he was, after all, willing to take Dr. O'Connor's word for it. The telepathy expert went on. Our test subject read it carefully, scanning rather than skimming. Cameras recorded the movements of his eyes in order for us to tell just what he was reading at any given moment, in order to correlate what was going on in his mind with the reactions of the machine's indicators, if you follow me. Malone nodded helplessly. At the same time, Dr. O'Connor continued blithely, we had Charlie in a nearby room recording his babblings. Every so often he would come out with quotations from The Blood is the Death. And these quotations corresponded exactly with what our test subject was reading at the time, and also corresponded with the abnormal fluctuations of the detector. Dr. O'Connor paused. Something, Malone realized, was expected of him. He thought of several responses and chose one. I see, he said. 
But the important thing here, Dr. O'Connor said, is the timing. You see, Charlie was incapable of continued concentration. He could not keep his mind focused on another mind for very long before he hopped to still another. The actual amount of time concentrated on any given mind at any single given period varied from a minimum of 1.3 seconds to a maximum of 2.6. The timing samples, when plotted graphically over a period of several months, formed a skewed bell curve with a mode at 2.0 seconds. Ah, Malone said, wondering if a skewed bell curve was the same thing as a belled skew curve, and if not, why not? It was, in fact, Dr. O'Connor continued relentlessly, a sudden variation in those timings which convinced us that there was another telepath somewhere in the vicinity. We were conducting a second set of reading experiments in precisely the same manner as the first set, and for the first part of the experiment our figures were substantially the same, but—he stopped. Yes, Malone said, shifting his feet and trying to take some weight off his left foot by standing on his right leg. Then he stood on his left leg. It didn't seem to do any good. I should explain, Dr. O'Connor said, that we were conducting this series with a new set of test subjects. Some of the scientists here at Yucca Flats. We wanted to see if the intelligent quotients of the subjects affected the time of contact which Charlie was able to maintain. Naturally, we picked the men here with the highest IQs, the two men we have who are in the top echelon of the creative genius class. He cleared his throat. I did not include myself, of course, since I wished to remain an impartial observer as much as possible. Of course, Malone said without surprise. The other two geniuses, Dr. O'Connor said, happened to be connected with the project known as Project Isle, an operation whose function I neither know nor care to know anything at all about. Malone nodded. Project Isle was the non-rocket spaceship. Classified, top secret, ultra secret, and he thought just about anything else you could think of. At first, Dr. O'Connor was saying, our detector recorded the time periods of uh, mental invasion as being the same as before. Then, one day, anomalies began to appear. The detector showed that the minds of our subjects were being held for as long as two or three minutes. But the phrases repeated by Charlie during these periods showed that his own contact time remained the same, that is, they fell within the same skewed bell curve as before, and the mode remained constant if nothing but the phrase length were recorded. Mm-hmm, Malone said, feeling that he ought to be saying something. Dr. O'Connor didn't notice him. At first we thought of errors in the detector machine, he went on. That worried us not somewhat, since our understanding of the detector is definitely limited at this time. We do feel that it would be possible to replace some of the electronic components with appropriate symbolization like that already used in the purely psionic sections, but we have as yet been unable to determine exactly which electronic components must be replaced by what symbolic components. Malone nodded, silently this time. He had the sudden feeling that Dr. O'Connor's flow of words had broken itself up into a vast sea of alphabet soup, and that he, Malone, was occupied in drowning in it. However, Dr. O'Connor said, breaking what was left of Malone's train of thought, young Charlie died soon thereafter, and we decided to go on checking the machine. It was during this period that we found someone else reading the minds of our test subjects, sometimes for a few seconds, sometimes for several minutes. Aha, Malone said. Things were beginning to make sense again. Someone else. That, of course, was the spy. I found, Dr. O'Connor said, on interrogating the subjects more closely, 
that they were, in effect, thinking on two levels. They were reading the book mechanically, noting the words and sense, but simply shuttling the material directly into their memories without actually thinking about it. The actual thinking portions of their minds were concentrating on aspects of Project Isle. In other words, Malone said, someone was spying on them for information about Project Isle? Precisely, Dr. O'Connor said, with a frosty teacher-to-student smile. And whoever it was had a much higher concentration time than Charlie had ever attained. He seems to be able to retain contact as long as he can find useful information flowing in the mind being read. Wait a minute, Malone said. Wait a minute. If this spy is so clever, how come he didn't read your mind? It is very likely that he has, O'Connor said. What does that have to do with it? Well, Malone said, if he knows you and your group are working on telepathy and can detect what he's doing, why didn't he just hold off on the minds of those geniuses when they were being tested in your machine? Dr. O'Connor frowned. I'm afraid that I can't be sure, he said, and it was clear from his tone that if Dr. Thomas O'Connor wasn't sure, no one in the entire world was, had been, or ever would be. I do have a theory, however, he said, brightening up a trifle. Malone waited patiently. He must know our limitations, Dr. O'Connor said at last. He must be perfectly well aware that there's not a single thing we can do about him. He must know that we can neither find nor stop him. Why should he worry? He can afford to ignore us, or even bait us. We're helpless, and he knows it. That, Malone thought, was about the most cheerless thought he had heard in some time. You mentioned that you had an insulated room, the FBI agent said after a while. Couldn't you let your men think in there? Dr. O'Connor sighed. The room is shielded against magnetic fields and electromagnetic radiation. It is perfectly transparent to psionic phenomena, just as it is to gravitational fields. Oh, Malone said. He realized rapidly that his question had been a little silly to begin with, since the insulated room had been the place where all the tests had been conducted in the first place. I don't want to take up too much of your time, doctor, he said after a pause, but there are a couple of other questions. Go right ahead, Dr. O'Connor said. I'm sure I'll be able to help you. Malone thought of mentioning how little help the doctor had been to date, but decided against it. Why antagonize a perfectly good scientist without any reason? Instead, he selected his first question and asked it. Have you got any idea how we might lay our hands on another telepath? Preferably one that's not an imbecile, of course. Dr. O'Connor's expression changed from patient wisdom to irritation. I wish we could, Mr. Malone, I wish we could. We certainly need one here to help us with our work, and I'm sure your work is important, too. But I'm afraid we have no ideas at all about finding another telepath. Finding little Charlie was purely fortuitous, purely, Mr. Malone, fortuitous. Ah, Malone said, sure, of course. He thought rapidly and discovered that he couldn't come up with one more question. As a matter of fact, he'd asked a couple of questions already, and he could barely remember the answers. Well, he said, I guess that's about it then, Doctor. If you come across anything else, be sure to let me know. He leaned across the desk, extending a hand. And thanks for your time, he added. Dr. O'Connor stood up and shook his hand. No trouble, I assure you, he said and I'll certainly give you all the information I can. Malone turned and walked out. Surprisingly, he discovered that his feet and legs still worked. He had thought they'd turned to stone in the office long before. It was on the plane back to Washington that Malone got his first inkling of an idea. 
the only telepath that the Westinghouse boys had been able to turn up, was Charles O'Neill, the youthful imbecile. All right, then. Suppose there were another one like him. Imbeciles weren't very difficult to locate. Most of them would be in institutions, and the others would certainly be on record. It might be possible to find someone, anyway, who could be handled and used as a tool to find a telepathic spy. And, happy thought, maybe one of them would turn out to be a high-grade imbecile, or even a moron. Even if they only turned up another imbecile, he thought wearily, at least Dr. O'Connor would have something to work with. He reported back to Burris when he arrived in Washington, told him about the interview with Dr. O'Connor, and explained what had come to seem a rather feeble brainstorm. "'It doesn't seem too productive,' Burris said, with a shade of disappointment in his voice. "'But we'll try it.' At that it was a better verdict than Malone had hoped for. He had nothing to do but wait, while orders went out to field agents all over the United States, and quietly but efficiently the FBI went to work. Agents probed and pried and poked their noses into the files and data sheets of every mental institution in the fifty states, as far at any rate as they were able. It was not an easy job. The inalienable right of a physician to refuse to disclose confidences respecting a patient applied even to idiots, imbeciles, and morons. Not even the FBI could open the private files of a licensed and registered psychiatrist. But the field agents did the best they could, and, considering the circumstances, their best was pretty good. Malone, meanwhile, put in two weeks sitting glumly at his Washington desk and checking reports as they arrived. They were uniformly depressing. The United States of America contained more subnormal minds than Malone cared to think about. There seemed to be enough of them to explain the results of any election you were unhappy over. Unfortunately, subnormal was all you could call them. Not one of them appeared to possess any abnormal psionic abilities whatever. There were a couple who were reputed to be poltergeists. But in neither case was there a single shred of evidence to substantiate the claim. At the end of the second week, Malone was just about convinced that his idea had been a total washout. A full fortnight had been spent on digging up imbeciles, while the spy at Yucca Flats had been going right on his merry way, scooping information out of the men at Project Isle as though he were scooping beans out of a pot, and, very likely, laughing himself silly at the feeble efforts of the F.B.I. Who could he be? Anyone, Malone told himself unhappily. Anyone at all. He could be the janitor that swept out the buildings, one of the guards at the gate, one of the minor technicians on another project, or even some old prospector wandering around the desert with a scintillation counter. Is there any limit to telepathic range? The spy could even be sitting quietly in an armchair in the Kremlin, probing through several thousand miles of solid earth to peep into the brains of the men on Project Isle. That was, to say the very least, a depressing idea. Malone found he had to assume that the spy was in the United States, that, in other words, there was some effective range to telepathic communication. Otherwise there was no point in bothering to continue the search. Therefore he found one other thing to do. He alerted every agent to the job of discovering how the spy was getting his information out of the country. He doubted that it would turn up anything, but it was a chance. And Malone hoped desperately for it, because he was beginning to be sure that the field agents were never going to turn up any telepathic imbeciles. He was right. They never did. End of Chapter 2